All right, I want to start by looking at this verse and then we'll pray. Uh, this is Proverbs 22, 6. And I'm guessing this is Henry Jesse's um, translation of it because it's one I'm not familiar with, but it looks very similar to one that you have all probably heard or learned earlier on. And that is catechize, which means teach or instruct orally, or begin the child in his way according to his capacity, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Now, I know this verse has been misused uh, many times by people saying, if you just teach your kids the right way, they'll be Christians. Um, And that's not always the case. Uh, Many of us, we have children who are not Christian. Maybe one day they will be, by the Lord's grace, but that's not an absolute factor. The thing is, at least they have the knowledge of the gospel, and God can bring that to their mind um, later in life, and that has been many the case for many children. And also, they, they learn certain things as far as how to serve God and what to believe, so that when they do become Christians, if that's God's will, they will know and have a good background for that by being raised that way. And that's one of the purposes of a catechism in church. So before we begin, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just bringing this church together. We have lots of different families from different backgrounds and different makeups. And Lord, you've gifted us with a lot of children in our church. And that's a great responsibility. It's it's a privilege. It's a blessing to have so many children. We have a new generation. But it's also a heavy responsibility because we're to raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And Lord, all of us fall short. We all need your grace and your mercy upon our efforts, even our best efforts. But Lord, we're also called to be responsible and faithful in training them and teaching them your word what to believe and what to practice. And so, Lord, I pray that this church will dedicate itself to such practices as to help us be able to pursue such a lofty goal. And so, Lord, as we study about these catechisms this week and next week, I pray that you bless us, help us to um, learn from them. And, Lord, if they're useful and they're biblical and it's something that will pass along the deposit of faith to the next generation. May we pursue it with all our means. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, um, I was given a couple of Sunday mornings to lead Bible study for you. We're starting, um, again, a new um, cycle of the catechism. And we have a whole bunch of young ones moving up to the next class um, from the, the class that um, April and Dina teaches up to the catechism class. And so we thought it would be a good time. We also have some in the catechism class that will be moving up and be among you um, on Sunday mornings in the adult Bible study. So we thought it would be a good time to start it again and have a new emphasis. We did a lot of good things with the first, first go around with it, and there are things we can improve on. And that's one of the goals of these two Sundays is to get parent involvement in what we're doing with the young people in our church and teaching them the catechism. And so in this study about catechisms, and especially Baptists and their use of catechisms, I thought it would be useful to begin with this Sunday, talk about definitions. What is a catechism? Some of you may be familiar with catechisms. Some of you may not be. Um, And also look at the history of their use, especially later among Baptists. I use various sources, and I don't want to go through all those in detail. I use some online articles. I use several books. But the two I use the most are listed here. This is particularly a helpful one, Tom Nettles. He was pretty much my mentor at seminary. Um, I took a lot of classes with him. He's a faithful teacher. Um, He just retired from the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. There are a lot of Calvinists there now, but very few, what I would say, Reformed Baptists. But he was one of them. 
and um, very faithful man. I think he wrote, he wrote the introduction to Brandon and Kurt Smith's book. And so he's a, he's a really good, good professor, knowledgeable, very good historian, and true to the Word of God. And so if you have a chance and you want to know more about catechisms, and there's a whole bunch of catechisms he includes in this book, I encourage you to buy the book, Teaching Truth, Training Hearts, The Study of Catechisms in Baptist Life by Tom Nettles. The other book um, was useful, but to a less degree. Um, Timothy George was the editor. Basically, all he does is write an introduction in it, but then he includes lots of confessions that Baptists have used, as well as covenants and catechisms, which are all important to the church life. So I encourage you to get a hold of that as well. Oop, went, hit the wrong button. So, when you hear the word catechism, what do you think of? <laughs> now, we're in the South, but we have lots of people that are from northern um, parts of the country. I almost think of it as a separate country. Um, just... <laughs> Sorry, Brooksy. I love you, though. Um, and a lot of those places in the, our country are familiar with Catholicism. We do have a um, Catholic church here in Jackson, and I don't know if they do catechism within the church, but a lot of people that have a Catholic background, or maybe a Lutheran background, have been familiar with catechisms. And so a lot of times when we Baptists hear the word catechism, we either don't know what it is, or if we have some familiarity with it, we think of it as something that's Catholic, right? Um, if you see a TV show portraying Catholics and children, usually they're teaching them a catechism or something. But that's kind of a, a misconception about catechisms. Because really, catechetical teaching really predates the division in the church between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. Um, with the Reformation and then the subsequent breaking up of the Reformed Protestant um, church into smaller denominations and groupings. You um, have catechetical teaching, but it all goes back even before the medieval church and the rise of Roman Catholicism. So what is a catechism? Well, the word catechism actually comes from a Greek root word, um, katechao, which means to teach orally or to instruct. And really, um, doing this study of catechisms I was expecting all catechisms to be questions and answers. That's not necessarily true either. The catechetical teaching, at least of the medieval church and perhaps the early church, was more memorization of, of documents such as the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, or maybe some of the other creeds of the early church. But traditionally, at least from a Protestant standpoint, they teach summaries of Christian doctrine through a question and answer format. The teacher or the parent will ask a question dealing with some doctrine of the Christian faith, and then the students are supposed to have memorized an answer um, to recite back to the teacher or to the parent. Very effective tool at learning basic Christian doctrine. And of course, these are some of the, the paintings I found online dealing with teaching catechisms. Um, this looks like a Dutch Baroque type painting, um, so showing kind of the Protestant roots in catechisms. Now this guy, I keep hitting the wrong button, um, looks like some kind of, he's wearing some kind of robe, but I'm not sure what tradition he's from. The people look kind of colonial. All right, so let's go back to the earliest use of catechisms. What were they used for? Why were they used? Um, in the early church, mostly you had Jewish adherents to Judaism that were coming into the church. As Paul went out and preached, the first place he preached was the synagogue. And the disciples reached out to the Jews in Jerusalem and Judea first. But then as it spread through the Roman world, you had more and more Gentiles brought into the faith. And some of them had a background. They were called God-fearers. But many of them did not. They were coming from a pagan background or maybe one of the mystical religions of um, Rome. Anyways, they were not familiar with the Old Testament or basic biblical doctrine. 
And so they were hearing about Christ. Many of them were converted, trusting in Christ as their Savior, but they did not have a lot of background. If you know anything about the early church, what were they enduring the first few centuries of the early church? Severe persecution. And naturally, as persecution arose, there are many people in the church that may not have been true believers, and they departed from the church. Now, some of them would depart, and then they would repent and come back. But there was a problem um, of people becoming apostate, of leaving the church. And to kind of correct this problem and to make sure that they were authentic believers, the early church entered this practice of catechism or catechetical teaching, of instruction, of recitation. That way, as the teachers went through this with the new disciples, they would kind of get more of an understanding of where they were spiritually, but also those adherents would know what they were getting into. And they would hold off baptism. Now, this is not necessarily a biblical practice. I believe that the more true foundation that we found in Scripture as we went through the baptism study, um, was that a couple years ago, Barry? Is to baptize when they come to faith. But you can understand why the practice arose of delaying baptism to Easter. And so throughout the year prior to Easter, any new convert would go through this catechetical training and instruction in the faith so that when they actually went under the waters, they would understand what they were getting into. They would understand the faith, which is not necessarily a bad practice as long as it's not delayed too much. All right, so within the first few centuries after the time of the apostles, new believers called catechumens would not be baptized to Easter Sunday. During the year post-dating their conversions but predating their baptisms, catechesis, or catechesis, which is the verbal teaching of the faith, would take the form of instruction and the memorization of basic Christian statements such as the Lord's Prayer and the Apostles' Creed so that new believers would know the faith, the deposit of faith would be entrusted to them. Um, they would understand what baptism actually meant and what Christianity was all about. And that was pretty much, um, well, going back, I didn't include this, but it's probably important to talk about the medieval church. The same sort of practice was done during the medieval church, but for a different reason. No longer was there persecution and the need to know that they actually understood the faith and that sort of thing, but a practice began after the third or fourth century of infant baptism, and therefore you needed something to kind of lead the, the people before confirmation in the Catholic Church. Um, both of those are considered sacraments in the Catholic Church, and because the high infant mortality rate, they started baptizing infants. They thought, believed baptism was necessary for forgiveness of sins, to get rid of original sin. So they baptized their babies so that they wouldn't go to hell upon death. And that was the belief system of the Roman Catholic Church in the middle, middle, medieval period. And for that reason, they wanted something to instruct their kids with so that when it came time to make the faith their own, um, at confirmation, they would be well trained. And so that was what catechetical teaching was for. And it was learning the Lord's Prayer. It was learning um, the Apostles' Creed and, and maybe some of the other creeds like the Nicene Creed and, and such. Well, our Protestant understanding, especially with the question and answer format for the catechism, really has its popularization with Martin Luther. Martin Luther, of course, was coming out from a Catholicism. Um, even early in his life, um, many of the priests did not even have a proper understanding of, of the doctrines that they were supposedly teaching and upholding within the church. And so he believed that this new generation of believers, as well as those that were going to be faithful ministers of the gospel needed some basic training in the faith. And so he developed two catechisms for that. Um, in, in 1529, he released both of these catechisms. One was the short catechism. This was the one more designed for children or those that were new to the faith, that did not know much Christian background. 
It required the memorization of the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer, very similar to what they were doing in the medieval church, yet um, just memorizing the Ten Commandments, the Apostles' Creed, and the Lord's Prayer doesn't mean you know what they mean, right? I mean, they're pretty simplistic in what they say, and it should be kind of obvious, but as you well know, as you learn something, there's always a depth to those things that you don't get superficially by just memorizing them, right? So, Luther designed questions and answers to teach the meaning of each line of the Lord's Prayer, of the Apostles' Creed, of the Ten Commandments, as well as the understanding of the proper use of baptism in the Lord's Supper, according to the Lutheran understanding. Then he designed a long catechism. This was designed because he knew that parents and teachers and even ministers within the Lutheran church um, sometimes we're ignorant of deeper Christian doctrine beyond just the basics that the children were learning. And so they were going to be the ones teaching the next generation, and so they had the need for a greater understanding of these biblical doctrines. The long catechism is basically along the same lines as the short catechism. It's just much more in depth. It was meant for teachers and for parents. Um, so they would teach as Luther... Whoop, is they, they would teach, as Luther said, with understanding, which makes sense. So we're going to start requiring y'all to learn the... I'm, I'm kidding. It's good practice, though. All right. Luther had two catechisms, and they're still held up in the um, Lutheran church as their, their basic catechisms. But it didn't just stay with Luther. Just as the Reformation didn't just stay in Germany. As the Reformation spread particularly to Switzerland and, and France under the teachings of Calvin and Zwingli, and then later um, to Scotland and England under um, John Knox and Thomas Cranmer, you had the spread also of the use of catechisms. So this question and answer format spread with the teachings of the Reformation. And some of the early catechisms um, were for Reformed Christians throughout Europe, um, Calvin produced the Genevan Catechism in 1541, and as Calvin was known to do, he wasn't ever really satisfied with his first work and would expand it throughout his lifetime. The Institutes of Christian Religion were small books to begin with, and they grew to the, the big books that we have today. And same with the um, Catechism. He expanded it in 1545 and in 1560. And this catechism was organized around the topics of faith, law, prayer, and sacraments. Probably the best known reformed catechism outside of English-speaking churches is the Heidelberg Catechism in 1563. And what gives it significance is that it was approved by reformed Christians at the Synod of Dort in 1618 through 1619. And this gave Reformed Christians a basic expression of their understanding of faith. And it became really the basis of the Westminster Shorter Catechism a century later in England at the Westminster Assembly. And many within the Reformed tradition still hold to this catechism. It's still a good one. It has been adopted. Um, let's see, what's his name? Hercules Collins, I think, adopted it as the Orthodox Catechism. And we have, we've got copies of that, too, I've seen. Um, but it's a very good Reformed catechism. Well, as the Protestant church grew, this goes back to our kind of our, maybe our un, ignorant understanding of catechism and that it's just a Catholic practice. Really, the, the Catholics were sort of copying the Protestants when they started the catechism in the form of question and answers and drilling their, their students that way as their catechetical teaching developed. You have to understand, um, the Protestant Reformation was spreading rapidly and they were trying to counter this with a counter-reformation. Well, most people in the Catholic Church knew that the Catholic Church had problems morally, within their government, um, there were even popes that had illegitimate children and that sort of thing. So they started 
trying to clean up the church because they knew that was one of the reasons that many Protestants were leaving. But they also knew another reason was because just like we lose Baptists to Jehovah Witnesses today, there was a vast ignorance among adherents to Roman Catholicism. And so when Protestants came around teaching their faith, they said, hey, yeah, that's probably what the Bible teaches. I've never heard that before. But if that's what the Bible says, I'm going to believe it. So the, in reaction to that, the Roman Catholics said, we better do a better job teaching our adherents too. So what has been useful for Protestants in teaching their, their young people? Catechisms, right? And so we're going to develop our own catechisms to ground Catholics in, in, in the faith. Um, they had u- witnessed the usefulness of Protestant catechisms in inculcating the Baptist, I mean, not the Baptist, the Protestant faith in its adherents and in the next generation of Protestants. And it made it effective, and as those catechisms were being taught to those Protestant young people, they were more grounded in what they believed, in what the Bible taught, and therefore they were harder for the Catholics to win back to Roman Catholicism. So, just to give you a couple of these, the first Catholic catechism was by a Jesuit priest in 1555 that was translated into Latin and German and was intended for the education of the clergy. What's remarkable here? There's one word that seems remarkable to me. German. Because if you go back to the Middle Ages, one of the things that Luther was rejecting was keeping the Bible and keeping the liturgy in Latin, which was a dead language. Now, most of our language today is based on Latin roots, especially two-syllable or greater words. Um, However, most of us, we wouldn't understand Latin if we heard it, right? Um, But they published this in Latin and German. So now they're understanding the, the fact that, hey, these people, if we don't reach them in their own language, they're going to depart and go to Protestantism. So I think that's significant there. Um, then you have the, the biggest thing that was in the Counter-Reformation. That was the Council of Trent. Um, you know, the ch- history of the church, any time there was heresy or a problem that arose within the church that was causing great schism and division within the church, they would hold a council, a meeting of, of bigwigs within the church, bishops and others, uh, to discuss these doctrinal problems. And so the Catholic Church said, hey, this Protestant church is not going away, and we need to address this. So they gathered together in the Council of Trent, and they condemned pretty much most Protestant teachings as anathema, as a curse. So if you believe in justification by faith alone, you're going to hell. Basically, this is what the Council of Trent said. But it also did other things. Um, they commissioned the first official catechism church-wide for the Roman Catholic Church. And it was published in Latin and, I thought this was significant too, Italian in 1566. And for four centuries, this was the main catechism for the Catholic Church and has only changed in its predominance within the Catholic Church with the Second Vatican Council, I think in the 1960s. Lots of things changed in the Catholic Church in the Second Vatican Council. Um, they quit doing the liturgies in Latin and started doing them in the, the common language of wherever the church was and many other things. All right, back to Protestantism, and especially important for our Baptist faith and life. We did a study on this about five years ago, I think it was, and we talked about the beginning of particular Baptist and I did a couple of weeks on where Baptists came from. If you remember from that, or if you don't, maybe you've studied it in other history, um, we come from the Puritan movement. There are a lot of historians out there, and I think incorrectly so, try to say that we came out of the Anabaptist movement in, in continental Europe, that we were basically Mennonites, you know, in England that speak English. That's not true. Um, if you look at the early Baptists, they, they, they had some influence, I believe. Um, but 
if you look at early Baptists, we were coming out of Puritan churches as we started studying our scriptures and um, coming across what we believe is believers' baptism and issues with church government and all that kind of thing. We started forming our own churches, and they came from Puritan churches primarily. There was a group of General Baptists, but they were fading away um, by the 1700s until they were revitalized. That's, that's a different subject for a different day. But the part of Puritanism can be seen, the high point, the apex, is at the Westminster Assembly. Not to go into a whole lot of British history, I could spend probably the next several Sundays doing this. The Reformation. Henry VIII wanted to divorce his wife. You know that story. So he broke the Church of England off from the Roman Catholic Church and declared himself head. Still Catholic in practice and faith, just different government. His son Edward VI, though, was raised by Protestant-leaning believers like Thomas Cranmer, who loved Luther, and so he started bringing it back strongly Protestant in its faith. When Mary became queen, she took it back to Catholicism, getting the nickname Bloody Mary by killing Protestants, and then her sister Elizabeth became queen and took it back to Protestantism. Well, Elizabeth, um, she was tired of all the fighting back and forth in England, so she struck a compromise and said, we're going to have a Protestant faith with Catholic practice, basically is what the Church of England developed into, right? The Anglican Church. If you've ever been to an Episcopalian church, um, a lot of what the Church of England did uh, is vestiges of Roman Catholic ritual and practice. And there were those within the Anglican Church that said, wait a minute, we want to stay in the church, but we don't like these practices. And so they were kind of referred to by others as Puritans. Well, they kind of liked the name, so it stuck. And so they wanted to purify the church of Catholic ritual, right? And so that's where the Puritans became prominent in. And they, their high point was the 1600s. Um, most of the members of parliament were Puritan. The king was heavily Anglican, favoring the Catholic practices, James I and Charles I. They had a civil war over it. Charles II lost his head in, in the whole thing. Um, and the Puritans won the Civil War. They lost the ultimate war, though, in England. For a decade or so, Oliver Cromwell ruled England, and then they, his son became the ruler, and they were going to go to the Republic, but he was not effective, the, the son of Oliver Cromwell. And so they asked for the king to come back, Charles II, the son of Charles I. When he came back, he hated Puritans, so he kicked them all out of the church. But in that in-between time, between the beheading of Charles and the restoration of the crown, you have the Westminster Assembly. And the Puritans are in power now under Oliver Cromwell, so they have an assembly to try to get the Church of England based on Puritan or Presbyterian understandings of government and scripture and doctrine, and to try to get it in line with the Church of Scotland, which has already gone to the Puritan um, beliefs. So the Westminster Assembly met 1643 to 1653. Theologians, pastors, they were appointed by Parliament to reform the Church of England upon Puritan and Presbyterian principles and to bring it into conformity with the Church of Scotland. Very um, hard-working assembly produced a lot of different important works, especially for Reformed Christians, especially for Reformed English-speaking Christians. Um, the most famous being probably the Westminster Confession of Faith, but also two catechisms, the Westminster Longer Catechism and the Westminster Shorter Catechism, a liturgical manual, and a new form of church government based upon Presbyterianism for the Church of England. It did not last very long, for when Charles II came back, he went back to the old Anglicanism, which was Protestant faith, Catholic practice, and the Puritans got the boot. Uh, it's also one of the things that led to the founding of Massachusetts Bay Colony here in America as Puritans were escaping the persecution under Charles I earlier, and then many more came over the, the next several decades as it went back to um, Anglicanism after the Restoration. 
All right. So, the Westminster Confession of Faith. We, we talk about the Second London Baptist Confession of 1689. Um, it was primarily based, if you read them side by side, it's like reading the Synoptic Gospels to some degree. Much of the same wording is, is in the Westminster Confession of Faith as it is in the, the Second London Baptist Confession. There are some changes here and there, especially trying to get the confession more in line with Baptist distinctives, believer's baptism, church government, and, and various other issues. But by and large, it's the same. There's a reason for that. We already have a first London Baptist Confession in 1644. It was smaller, but a lot of people were accusing Baptists of being Anabaptists or not Reformed or not like the rest of the Puritans or that sort of people in England. And so to show our kinship with the Reformed Christians, the Puritans and others in England, we adopted to show, hey, we are basically of like faith as you. We just believe that only believers should be baptized and, and certain other things. So it was to show our kinship with Puritan Reformed Christians in England. All right, so pertinent to our study about the Baptist Catechism, we need to talk about the Westminster Shorter Catechism just for a few minutes. This is the most well-known and widely used catechism among English-speaking Protestant churches. Many Presbyterian denominations still use it. The Church of Scotland still has it as its main catechism, and so it's pretty prevalent. Um, again, the Baptist catechism that we're going to be looking at and what we're teaching the children in the catechism class is based upon the Westminster Shorter Catechism, just as the Second London was based on the Westminster Confession of Faith. Two different documents, right? I may have been confusing with what I just said. But we have the, the Second London Confession, and we also have the Baptist Catechism. They're both based on the, these statements coming out of the Westminster Assembly. Our Confession of Faith is based on the Westminster Confession of Faith. Our Catechism, the Baptist Catechism, or Keech's Catechism, sometimes it's referred to, um, is based on the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Many of the questions are the same. In fact, one of the tools we're using to teach the class is from a Presbyterian standpoint. We're not teaching them infant baptism or anything. Don't, don't worry about that. But it's still good stuff. We just skip that, the, the part that we believe is an error. All right, so let's get the Baptist Catechisms. Um, there are literally hundreds of Baptist catechisms. Uh, historically, uh, we came out of English Puritanism, and just as Puritans felt it was necessary to pass along that deposit of faith to the next generation, Baptists felt the same thing. We care about our kids, don't we? We want to see them raised in the faith. And just as Puritans practiced the practice of using catechisms to teach that deposit of faith to the next generation. Baptists also inherited that practice of catechizing their kids. And catechisms are an excellent tool for doing this. One of the earliest catechisms that we have is Henry Jesse's Catechism for Babes, um, 1652. And one thing that Jesse said is a lot of the other catechisms that he's seen were not suitable for all ages. And so he wanted one for younger children, and so that's the reason he develops this one. And you can see in the subtitle, it says, suitable to their capacity more than others have been formerly. So this is for little children. Um, a, a good one for, um, you know, kindergarten, first, second, third grade type children. Um, Jesse, as well as others, were, was a firm believer that catechisms should be age appropriate and that various catechisms should be developed and used usefully as determined by the age and ability of the learner. And so, yes, Baptist catechism is good. I'm not saying that I'm going to teach Matthew the Baptist catechism over the next year. I'm going to wait until he's a little bit older and 
has a little bit more ability. There are other catechisms, though, and I'm going to go over that next week, that some of them are found in here that are more useful for that age. And there are some that are even better for teenagers later on. So those that are graduating our catechism class, there are other catechisms. You're not out of it yet. <laughs> Before we parents laugh, though, if we want our teenagers to learn it, perhaps we as adults should learn it as well. And I'm speaking to myself as I say that. It's good practice. Sometimes we know the right thing to do, but because of the work involved, we're hesitant to do it, aren't we? All right, so let's get down to the Baptist Catechism, often called Keech's Baptism. Um, in church history, and Baptist history, Benjamin Keech is one of those early particular Baptists. He was one of the signers of the Second London Baptist Confession. He was also pastor of Horsley Down or Horse Lie Down Church in London, which became the Metropolitan Tabernacle later when Spurgeon became pastor. Um, it's called Keech's Bad Catechism, though there's some debate on whether Keech actually wrote it or not. There was an earlier work that Keech wrote for the instruction of children, and it was contained in it, but we don't have any of those books in existence that we know of anymore. But we do know that um, the General Assembly of Particular Baptists that met in London in 1693, this was a later one than the one that published the Second London Confession. Um, it met in 1677, and then every few years they would meet again. Anyways, they commissioned William Collins to produce a catechism, and this is the basic work of his um, production. Now, most people believe it was based on Keech's catechism, um, so that's the reason it's still called Keech's catechism. Um, again, it was based on the Westminster Shorter Catechism, both in America, both the Philadelphia Baptist Association and the Charleston Baptist Association, two of the, the dominant Baptist associations in America, both adopted its use for their denomination. Their association, I mean. Charles Spurgeon loved it, but he adapted, he, he did a lot of work adapting different things, but he adapted the Baptist Catechism and shortened it um, in the 19th century for use in the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Southern Baptist. Um, I know we don't belong to the Southern Baptist Convention, but we're still Southern Baptist, at least historically and from our roots, we're Southern Baptist, um, and probably adhere more faithfully to what Southern Baptists believed than the Convention still does. But as our heritage shows, Southern Baptists believed in catechisms. Already noted, the Charleston Baptist Association had adopted it as its official catechism. Richard Furman, who was a historic Baptist leader in the 19th century, um, he was pastor of First Baptist Charleston, the most prominent church in the South, as well as the first president of the Triennial Convention. Let me tell you what the Triennial Convention was. It was Baptists in America getting together to support missions. And it was the forerunner of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, the Triennial Convention was both North and South, though, and then because of issues over sectional differences, we split into two different denominations, Northern Baptist and Southern Baptist. And we don't need to go through all that history, but um, he was the first president of the Triennial Convention. Um, he was a firm believer in the use of Bad the Baptist Catechism. I want to read a quote, and maybe just a minute. Let me go through this first. When the Southern Baptist Sunday School Board, sorry, Robin, but that's what they called it, um, was first um, organized, one of the first works that they published was a catechism by James P. Boyce. Does it, is anybody familiar with his name? Um, if you know his name, he was the founder of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and its first president. Someone else that was in the founding of Southern Seminary was John Broadus, one of the greatest Baptist preachers we had in the 19th century. Wrote an excellent book on preaching. Um, for some reason, the Sunday School Board didn't last, but it was reorganized in 1891, and its very first publication 
was a catechism of Bible teaching by John Broadus. What happened to catechisms? Question. Since Baptists have historically used catechism, what caused them to fall out of usage in Baptist churches and families? Answer. The same thing that caused sound expository preaching, congregational singing of doctrinal hymns, and corrective church discipline to fall out of usage, as well as many other good practices. Today's pietistic leanings. Now, you may not be familiar with that. Pietism and Puritanism. Um, different um, movements within the evangelical church that go back to a century right after the Reformation. All right. There are many similarities. There are a lot of good things in pietist churches, a lot of things that I would embrace and would be common with Puritanism. Let's look at these real quick. An emphasis on conversion. Many people thought they were members of the church, therefore they were fine with the faith. They knew their, their confessions, they knew their catechisms, but they were not converted. So without being born again, one may not enter the kingdom of heaven. So this emphasis on the new birth. You see this in George Whitfield's preaching. You see this later on in the 19th century with the writings of J.C. Ryle and others. The need to live godly lives. You can know the head knowledge, but if you're not living it, you're not being consistent with what you profess. If you love me, you obey my commandments. Be holy as God is holy. And the importance of personal and small group Bible study. The Holy Scriptures are able to make one wise to salvation. And so different formats are available for learning our Bibles, right? These are things that Puritanism and Pietism have in common. All right. The main difference between the two is the lack of theological vigilance among Pietists. Now, you need to know what Pietists were. There was a Lutheran pastor named Spainer. Um, I can't remember his name. John Jacob Jinglehammer. No, it's <laughs> Jacob Spainer or something like that. Um, anyways, he noticed the cold, dead orthodoxy of Lutheranism a century or two after Luther. And so he began a personal Bible study in his home in which they went over the sermon and they sang hymns, they prayed, and they studied scripture. Good things to do. Um, but the pietists were reacting to the cold, dead orthodox that knew the creeds, they knew the catechisms, but they just had a head knowledge and not a heart knowledge. So they kind of went to the opposite extreme. We need to live for Jesus. You know, you've heard that kind of thing, right? That's the pietist mindset. Doctrine doesn't matter as much. Now, I'm speaking loosely for, for pietists. It's not true. There, there are many great theologians of the pietists, but inherently in their, their system, in their way of thinking, it was more experiential based. It was more on knowing and having a relationship with Christ rather than having knowledge of doctrine and theological understanding. It was also an issue of not thinking doctrine was important enough to inform your practical living. They Absolutely. Could, you know, they wouldn't take, it's the both and, not the They divorced it, yeah. And the other thing, too, on that, they were coming out of this, some of them knew that they didn't know Christ, but they knew their catechism. So they said, what good is a catechism if it doesn't lead me to Christ? And so the error there is there were people that heard preaching that didn't know Christ. So should we get rid of preaching? Absolutely not. You don't get rid of the good tool just because it's used incorrectly. And that, that's the problem. Same reason we have aversion to confessions and stuff. All right, so experience triumphed over doctrine or, or trump doctrine. The church today has witnessed the jettison of heady doctrinal pure religion of the Puritans for the experiential religion of the Pietists. And I think it can be seen in these, seen in these two, two hymns. Now, this is your favorite hymn. I'm sorry. Don't, I'm, not, I'm stepping on your toe. Um, in the garden, um, just l look at the words. And he walks with me, and he talks with me. He tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Very one-on-one, -on -one personal 
touch with Christ, not a corporate song, really. Even if you sang this, it really doesn't have a place in the church because it's personal pronouns throughout it, and it's about your own private experience of Christ and not necessarily the church. And then immortal and invisible, God only wise, in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Kind of a different view of God in his holiness, in his transcendence, isn't it? Anyways, praise courses today emphasize the personal experience that we have with God, not the holiness of the living God in his full-orbed deity. Um, we want to present a non-threatening atmosphere where the attendees are welcome to participate in the experience. It's me-focused. Um, the discipline to learn catechisms in such an environment, it's just foreign, isn't it? It, it takes work. It, it takes discipline. And it may seem offensive or boring to many. Um, for this reason, teaching catechisms has the threat of only communicating head knowledge without a relationship with Jesus Christ. Therefore, such practice seems suspect to the prevalent pious mindset. Just, I'm going to close right now. But one illustration from something I heard yesterday. Um, Matthew's flag football game. I was with other um, coaches, and I heard two of them talking about their church building. And this is not necessarily this, but he was talking about, yeah, we have this new church facility that, 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 that's really, you know, on the edge, cutting edge and stuff like that. It, it's modern. It, it, it would draw people, but we have our old church building, building with its steeple out front, and people see that and think, oh, that's just an old, old church. And they have that old mindset, and we, we don't want to go there. So the whole thing is we need to be relevant, and catechisms are not relevant in this mindset. Really, they are, though. And we'll talk more about that next week.